Hi, everybody. Hey. So, welcome to Advanced Java Programming here at Portland State uh, here in the winter of 2020. Um, my name is David Whitlock. I'm the instructor for this course. Um, and I am really excited to be teaching uh, this winter. Um, I've been teaching this course for a very, very long time, uh, and it's been quite a while since I've had the opportunity to teach during like the normal school year. Usually they have me in the summer, which is fine when they, you know, when all the real professors want to go on vacation or take their sabbaticals or whatever, you know, they let the adjuncts teach then. Um, but uh, I, I'm really excited to be teaching here in the winter for a full 11 weeks. Um, in this most excellent classroom. This is my favorite classroom to teach in. It's got really great facilities and we'll be taking full advantage of them uh, in the course. Um, so I'm really <coughs> excited about that. Um, let's see here, I prepared a little slideshow with a couple of slides to get everybody started to sort of give us an idea of, uh, of what we're gonna do tonight and then uh, we'll also learn what we're doing the rest of the course. Um, so, uh, we've got a lot of stuff to cover tonight. Um, we'll probably go close to the full four hours, um, which will be a long slog for everybody, especially you. Um, so let's, uh, let's dive into it. So uh, first, uh, I'll introduce myself and the graders, the people who will be helping you uh, uh, navigate the course. We'll talk about the course, we'll talk about the syllabus, all the content that we're going to cover, uh, how the grading works, uh, all the various pieces, parts of the course. And then we'll dive right into it. We'll create our first Java project. Uh, I'll be doing some code. You'll be uh, hopefully playing along at home, those of you who have, uh, have machines, have laptops. Um, and then we'll learn about a couple of our uh, assignments, including the Java cones, which is a good way uh, to learn about the Java programming language. We'll also learn about test-driven development and uh, learn how TDD can be applied in the Java project. So a lot of stuff tonight uh, that will uh, begin our adventure. Uh, but first, I want to tell you about the people that, uh, that you'll be working with. Uh, there's myself. Uh, I, uh, I work for a company called uh, Tripwire downtown. Um, we're also part of the PSET program at PSU. We have a long uh, relationship with the university. Um, and joining me will be two graders. Um, the first is Quishi, and she's here tonight. Oh, they're in the back. Awesome. <laughs> um, also, uh, Victor uh, will, be, uh, will be grading for us also. Um, you'll, be see, you'll be seeing a lot of them in class necessarily, but you'll be seeing a lot of them online. Um, so when we talk about the, uh, the, uh, the projects and how they're graded and how you get those grades, um, we'll, uh, you'll, you'll see how Quishi and, and Victor are part of the course. Um, but we're all here to, to help you, to learn what you uh, what, what we want to learn out of the course, to help you navigate the projects um, and provide you feedback on, on how you're doing. Um, a word about this course and its popularity. Um, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm I'm tickled after almost 20 years of teaching this course um, that uh, that it's it's still so popular. Um, so popular, so 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 popular that uh, in the summer it's usually overbooked. And I have to turn people away. Um, and uh, over the last couple of years, uh, students have lobbied the department to offer it more often. Um, and I was just really pleased when Mark Jones, the department chair, reached out to me and said, hey, would you like to teach in the winter? I'm like, yes, that'd be great. Um, because uh, I, I get an, you know, an opportunity to share uh, what, 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 what this course is all about with more people over the course of the year. Um, so thank you very much for your interest in the course, for signing up, um, for allowing us to have the space and, uh, and people like the graders to support us. It's all because of you and your interest in the material. Or maybe you had nothing better to do uh, on a Wednesday night, and, and that's fine. Uh, we'll be talking about syllabus and everything, but any fundamental questions uh, before we get started? No? Okay. Cool. Let's dive into it then. Okay. The syllabus. So, in this course, uh, we're going to learn about the Java programming platform. We're going to learn how to develop... Uh, modern contemporary software using modern contemporary software techniques uh, in, in Java. Um, and I hope that we enjoy ourselves along the way. There's a lot to cover. Um, my experience showed that you'll be learning some new things that you maybe haven't seen in other courses. Um, and while that can be challenging, I think it also can be quite rewarding. So how are we going to do this? Um, there are a, a number of tools that we use uh, in our learning. 
Uh, the first is uh, lectures that are online. So for I mean, many years, I taught this course sort of traditionally. I would get up here and pontificate about Java for three hours, and you all fall asleep and then go home and hopefully be able to do your projects. Um, and it got to the point where even I was sick of hearing my own voice. So I was like, okay, something's got to change. And so then uh, a few years ago, I flipped the course. I, uh, I recorded the, uh, the lectures in the comfort of my own home, um, edited them down, and put them all up on YouTube. So as far as the content of this course is concerned, uh, there's not going to be lectures. Yes, I'll talk to you like this, but it's not going to be like me speaking to a bunch of slides. You can watch, actually please watch the, uh, the stuff online. It's all referenced on the homepage, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, and instead, what we do in class is we talk, we program together, we, uh, explore, uh, we explore software development and software engineering uh, as, as a group. You'll be seeing a lot of code in this course. Uh, the code is all available on GitHub for you to go um, uh, make your own clone and experiment with, uh, tweak it, debug it, work with it, uh, and to learn from it. And then as far as what you'll be producing for this course, there's a multi-phase project, a project that's built up over time. We'll be getting the first installment of it, installment of it assigned tonight. Um, and then over the, the duration of the course, you'll be building up on that um, every week or so. And uh, it wouldn't be a college course without quizzes and exams. Uh, the quizzes, and ex quizzes are all online on D2L, um, D2L, and uh, there's also a final exam. And so we'll see in a little while how much everything's worth. So those are the kinds of things you're going to be doing in this course. Um, you know, it's advanced programming in Java, and like in that order, it's more advanced stuff than you've seen before. It's programming, and by the way, the language that we're using is Java. Um, and so then, you know, the idea is that uh, I hope that you can be exposed to and get experience with things that you, maybe you haven't seen so far uh, in your careers. So are we gonna, what are we going to learn about? These are the kinds of things that are covered in the lectures. There's uh, the Java language syntax, which, uh, for show of hands, who here has programmed in Java before? Should be everybody, right? You've seen at least one of your courses. Good. Um, if maybe you're a little rusty or if it's been a while, there's uh, you know lots of review stuff either out there on the web, and there's also a, um, a lecture uh, that I provide that provides a good overview. Um, the nice thing about that is that covers all the things that I expect you to know, so um, that will probably be a good place to start. We'll be seeing a lot of object-oriented programming and object-oriented design. So Java is an object-oriented programming language, and its APIs leverage uh, the properties of object-oriented programming quite a lot. Um, and so then we'll see throughout the course, whether it's looking at an API or seeing how to design uh, the interaction between two processes or between a, a user and the implementation of the user interface, uh, we'll see lots of object-oriented programming. Um, We'll also be diving a lot into other people's code, and specifically all of the uh, classes, or a lot of the classes, in the uh, <coughs> Java library. So these are things like you know, utility classes, like you know, linked lists and hash maps. You, know, you won't be writing your own linked list in this course. No, you'll be using somebody else's. Um, someone else who is probably more experienced, smarter, older, not as good looking as you, but it's you know, somebody else's class. We'll be learning about I.O. facilities, uh, all sorts of good stuff that comes with the Java programming language. And we'll be seeing that stuff throughout the course. You'll be learning about it in like weeks two or three, but you'll go back to those uh, interfaces and classes later in the course. Now, beyond just programming, learning how to program um, in Java, uh, we'll be covering a lot of things uh, that are just good software engineering practices. Uh, so you'll see a lot of unit testing in this course. Uh, you guys heard of unit testing before, okay, right? Um, and maybe you've seen a little bit in your course. Well, here it's just how we write code. Um, we do a lot with test-driven development. So the, you know, the whole idea is that the tests, well, yes, it's more code that you need to write. They help you go faster because you can change your code, you can evolve your code, you can try things and uh, be confident in trying those things uh, because you'll know if you've broken something. So we'll see test-driven development and we'll also see uh, how to build Java projects. Um, Towards the, about in the middle of the course, the projects start getting more complex. There are more pieces, parts. We're building web applications. We'll be building Android applications by the end. Um, and uh, you don't want to be building all this stuff by hand. There are uh, really good uh, tools for building Java projects in a very standard way, and we'll be leveraging those. Um, after we uh, get our feet wet with uh, developing Java applications that run on the command line, we'll be looking at web applications. We'll be looking at how to write REST APIs uh, in Java. We'll be learning about some of the fundamental um, tools that Java has for developing web applications. 
And then the, uh, the, towards the end of the course, there are a couple of uh, advanced topics that we'll be covering. One is the dependency injection design pattern, which is a way of structuring your code so that your, uh, the components of your code are nicely decoupled, makes it easier to test, easier to reason about, and easier to evol evolve. Um, and then we'll uh, complete the course uh, with learning how to develop user interfaces uh, with Android. I I've always had uh, a UI component to the course. Um, it's changed a lot over the years. Originally, it was like you know writing applications for your uh, for the desktop uh, using tools like a Swing and probably even AWT before that. Um, and uh, while the Java language and a lot of the APIs are, are, are still uh, fit to purpose and still good to use today. The tools for writing user interfaces have evolved quite a lot. We went through, um, for several years, I used a toolkit called Google Web Toolkit for building web applications in Java, which was neat, but eventually got uh, kind, of, kind of tired. And now we're using Android. Um, and so then, uh, you know, we'll be spending whatever it is, the last three or so weeks of the course exploring that. And it really builds on all the stuff that you've learned up to that point um, because it uses Java. It uses the Java APIs, it uses object-oriented programming, plus a lot of other stuff also to write um, applications for you know, small devices. So those are the things we're going to cover. And it's a lot, um, even for 11 weeks. So uh, you know, this is, and we'll talk more about this later, uh, this course is challenging. And uh, I hope you get your money's worth. So, something always important for the first day of class, how does your grade work? Um, the majority of your grade is influenced by the, uh, the, the projects that you do, the multi-phase project that you'll be building up, um, and then also the Java codes. This is the code that you write, and this accounts for the majority of your grade. Um, it's a programming course, and so then what you're graded on is the, is the code that you write. Um, the quizzes, <coughs> excuse me, the quizzes, uh, there'll be eight of them. Um, we'll drop the lowest one just in case you know you're having a bad hair day or whatever. Um, does anybody still say that anymore? I didn't, probably not. Um, you're going to get a lot of that in this course. Uh, yes, the programming language is 20 years old, and so are a lot of the jokes. Uh, each uh, either, of the eight quizzes, we drop the lowest one, uh, and each of those seven quizzes is worth three percent. Um, so you know a, a good chunk of your grade is uh, influenced by the quizzes. So please do all of that. Um, they're online using D2L. You should all be registered. Uh, you should all, they should all be available to you um, because you're registered for the course. Um, oh, and note that two of the quizzes are actually surveys. Um, this is, uh, I want your feedback during the course. Those are often a different part of D2L. Um, and just be, you know, watch out for that as you're, as you're using D2L. Because we have 11 weeks, there are some things I'm experimenting with. So for several years now, um, there's been a component of the course involving pair programming and mob programming. So pair programming is like two people working together at a keyboard to, uh, to write some code. And mob programming is a bunch of people huddled around a projector looking at someone write code and helping them do it. Um, I'm, I, when, I, when I was able to secure this classroom, I was really excited because this is like the ideal classroom for that, right? I mean, the tables allow people to pair up really easily. These projectors around the perimeter are, are super awesome. Um, and, and, uh, I, and so one of the things I want to make sure that the students get out of this course is experience uh, trying this out. Um, it's something that people do now. It's not for everybody. And uh, you know, one of the nice things about being a student is that you get to try things and determine whether or not you like them. Um, and so then, uh, in order to, uh, well, for lack of a better word, force you to get this experience, um, there are, uh, each of you will be required to participate in one pair programming session and another, and one mob programming session uh, over the turn. So uh, there are, there are three, uh, there'll be three opportunities in class to pair program, and each person is required to go to one of those. Uh, and another three opportunities to mob program. Again, each person is required to uh, attend uh, one of those. Um, and then there'll be a, a D2L quiz that basically asks you to reflect on it. Um, so I'm you know, interested in what your experiences were. Uh, I'll want to link off to your code so I can see what it is that you, uh, that, that you did. And we'll provide you some uh, feedback on, uh, on that reflection. Um, and so each one of those reflections is worth 3.5%. Um, of your final grade. This is an experiment we're trying. Um, uh, I, I hope that everybody uh, at least gets to experience uh, mob programming and pair programming, and I'm really curious to hear what you all think of it. And yes, there is a final exam given on you know, the last day of class, but it's only worth 12% of your grade. 
my philosophy is, uh, well, when I was a student, I did not appreciate the classes where, like, the majority of my grade was based on, you know, a two-hour final exam. That's ridiculous, right? I, uh, well, yes, you know, I expect you to learn things to be able to demonstrate that you learn things, but, you know, I make you demonstrate it every week, not just, you know, uh, preparing for some final exam. Um, so, final exam, you need to take it. Uh, it's worth 12%. You know, that is like a full uh, letter grade, um, but it does, it's not going to make or break, uh, you know, your, your pass-fail. Some other things about grading. Um, so there's a lot of work that's due, um, especially the projects. Uh, you have two late days to use on project submission, uh, project submissions, and they can be used whenever you want uh, during the course, but you only have two of them. Uh, you can also uh, resubmit one project for regrading uh, within one week. Um, and, and this is in case, you know, maybe you misunderstood a requirement or like all the test cases failed because of a silly little mistake. I don't want you to lose credit on it. Uh, and so then you can get a, uh, oops, my bad, another thing people don't say anymore, um, uh, uh, regrade uh, within a week of the original grading. Uh, but otherwise, my policy is not to accept any other late work. Um, as far as people ask about the curve, um, uh, in theory, yes, there's a curve for this course. In practice, though, um, I, it's been a very long time since I've applied a curve. Uh, most people, uh, you know, what I found is that the way the, gra the grades naturally distribute, it pretty much matches uh, the, you know, the, 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 the standard PSU uh, grading scheme. So whatever it is, you know, 90, 90 and above is an A of some sort, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh, and, yeah, it might also be, and here again, I reserve the right to, I don't think I've had to do it. Uh, boy, if everybody is like over in the A range, then probably I haven't pushed you hard enough. Um, and so I'll, I'll find a grading scheme that, you know, that, that makes sense. Ah, um, so this course is cross-listed as an undergraduate course and a graduate course. And uh, when it comes to assigning the letter grades, I have, uh, I, you know, I have two, I have two curves. I have one for the undergraduate, one, or I have two grading schemes, one for the graduate, one for the undergraduate courses. Um, and so then graduate students and undergraduate students will not be compared against each other for the purposes of the final grade. However, everybody gets the same assignments. It's basically the same course, um, uh, but you just won't be graded against students in a different section. Um, this is never a problem, but the lawyers tell me I have to tell you this. Don't cheat. Um, I'll catch you. I use this tool called Moss, which uh, was developed a long time ago to detect software plagiarism. It's very smart. Um, it's probably smarter than you are. Uh, although maybe if you can outsmart it, I couldn't tell if it was smarter than you are. Um, you know, so if you do dumb things, just like rename your variables or try to change a little bit of logic here and there, it'll find it. Uh, again, I haven't had problems with cheating in a very long time. Uh, you know. You all know what it means to cheat, but just in case you don't, um, the department says that it's uh, cheating to submit for credit work that you did not create or allow your work to be submitted as the work of another student. Uh, when it comes to your assignments, uh, the policy that I recommend that you follow is that you can talk all you want, you can draw all the pictures that you want, it's okay to work uh, with other people, but don't share code. Don't look at someone else's code and try to you know, prevent people from looking at your code. This is an interesting uh, contrast with like the pair program where it's like, yeah, work together and learn to collaborate. But unfortunately, because it's part of your grade, uh, or at least the project part is part of your grade, um, please don't collaborate with people uh, on the projects. It's just the way the course is. Um, let's see here. Lots of miscellaneous things. Uh, there are lecture notes. Uh, I speak to you. I'm going on Mr. Rogers here. Um, I... Uh, you know, I, I, the, the, the online lectures are basically just me talking to the lecture notes and providing uh, more detail. Um, if you want paper copies of them, there are four by four uh, slides that you can print out uh, for yourself. I won't be providing you with any paper this term, except maybe the final exam. Um, however, I, I do expect that you come to class uh, having reviewed them, because uh, oftentimes what we'll talk about here in class uh, is uh, requires information that's there online. So. Um, in addition to like doing the assignments and stuff, please make sure to keep up with the with the lectures. You'll get a lot more out of class, and you'll be able to do your homework better if you uh, keep up with that. Um, please don't wait until the last minute to start the projects. 
They might seem easy on paper, but the experience of my students has been that there's some complexity there and um, that there are things that they don't realize. And so they've told me to tell you, um, don't wait until the last minute. Um, we'll cover this next week, but um, a, part, a part of an important component of the code that you develop is documentation that goes along with it. And I strongly encourage you to document your code as you write it. Um, so to be able to explain it in words in addition to uh, just explaining it in code. Um, when it comes to, oh, there it goes, it's even bigger now, asking questions. Um, I'm ultimately here for you. Uh, you know, I just love hearing my nasally voice bounce off the wall and come right back at me. Um, but I'm here to help you learn. And so that if you have a question, uh, please, you know, raise your hand. And if I'm droning on, you know, get my attention some other way. Um, don't throw anything hard or sharp at me. Um, but uh, I want you to ask it. I don't want you uh, to uh, sit there, you know, feeling that you don't understand it or, um, or, or to leave and then feel that you, you know, didn't get a, this wasn't a good use of your time. Um, my experience has been is that if you have a question, you're probably not the only one. So, uh, you know, please raise the question. Please raise your questions. There's no shame in asking. This is a senior level course, graduate level course, um, and if you're taking other courses that have a lot of uh, heavy workload, especially heavy programming courses like operating systems or compilers or whatever, um, you might want to reevaluate re your schedule. You know what you're capable of, and uh, yep, learning is all about stretching and uh, exploring, uh, exploring new things, um, but uh, I want to make sure that you're set up for success. That's making sure that you know you're taking a, a course load that that you can handle. Uh, you're not going to enjoy the course. You're not going to get a lot out of it if you're uh, you know, constantly firefighting uh, competing priorities. Um, I give you uh, a lot of code to look at, um, and uh, the reason I give it to you isn't to show off like how good my code is because it's not. Um, but it's it's so that you can go home and play with them and uh, to to look at what I've done. Um, to uh, you know, figure out if it's something that's, uh, that makes sense for the work that you're doing, um, or just you know, to learn, it's a good way to learn Java also. Um, I work during the day. I'm not on campus the rest of the week. Um, I do have office hours, but it's basically me eating dinner right before uh, class. Um, so I'll be hanging out at Hot Lips Pizza. Um, luckily, they've got like, good tables and stuff. I'll be at one of the big tables. Um, it, uh, it, it's worked really well. Um, I try to be as available as I can um, outside of, uh, of Wednesday afternoons and evenings. Um, so uh, we use Slack. Um, I have like my own Slack workspace, so I don't use like the PSU one, um, or the, you know, the PSU CS one, because I want to have multiple channels and have uh, a more structured uh, Slack environment. Um, and so uh, there's a survey program, which I mentioned below. Uh, after you run that, I'll know who you are. I'll have your email address, and what I'll do is I will send you an invitation to join the, um, the, the, the Slack group for the course. Uh, you can also email me. Um, uh, I, I, my primary uh, address is still the CS one, which is whitlock at cs.pdx.edu. Um, come to find out, uh, there is uh, uh, another David Whitlock at Portland State. So if you email whitlock at pdx.edu, it goes to this guy who like works on the east side in some art department or something like that. He probably doesn't enjoy all your Java questions. Um, so just be extra careful uh, when you uh, when you email uh, to make sure that it's actually me that you're emailing. Um, if you're like uh, if, you're, if you're being prompted like in Gmail or something for um, for David Whitlock's at PSU, I am whitlockcd at pdx.edu if you want to use just my PSU email. Um, very importantly, and I think I'll just walk through it now, is the class's uh, web page. So here at uh, web.cecs.pdx.edu slash tilde Whitlock is the home page for the course. Um, it has the course schedule on it. Um, and so then I have all the content that uh, not only do we cover during class, but stuff that I want you to make sure of come prepared. Uh, knowing before class, um, and this is really uh, you know where I recommend that you start. So while I use D2L for the quizzes, I don't use it for anything else. I find it kind of clunky, um, and uh, so I use all of this. It's also the place where you can get links to the um, to the slides, uh, like those, and probably more importantly, slides that look like these. Uh, these are the slides that I then cover in the um, 
in the screencasts. And again, all that's up on YouTube. Okay, lastly, uh, there is an important first step in this course, and that's to run your very first Java program. Um, and this is a, uh, a program that you can run on, as you must run, on the PSU machines. So uh, we'll talk more about this when we talk about how to submit your, court, your, your work next week. I'll get you in a minute. Um, and that is uh, that you can develop on any machine that you want, but I'm going to grade your code on the PSUs, on uh, PSUs, the department's uh, Linux machines. So you got to make sure that your environment is configured correctly there and that your code runs there. Um, and to sort of test that out, please run this survey program. And what it'll do is it'll ask you some information about yourself, like your name and everything like that. Um, and uh, then it creates a little XML file that gets emailed to the, uh, the grader's email account. Uh, and then I extract that and I use that in this gradebook program that I wrote to record your grades. Um, so this is how I found out about you. This is how I know how to contact you. Uh, so please make sure that you give me an email address that you check. Um, and uh, that's probably the most important thing, and your name and everything, so I can uh, record all of that. Um, again, I don't use D2L or any other systems to record your grades to do it on my own, um, but uh, you know what I'll do is, well, we'll talk more about getting feedback on your um, projects next week. Uh, so I got one question. Yep. Yeah, so running that on, yep. the, on the lab machines, yeah. um, it was compiled with a later version of Ah, so you probably need to then configure your Java environment for a more modern version. If you say Java dash version, what does it tell you? Let me bring up. 1.8.0. Okay, 1.8. Wow, that's so three years ago. Um, so then let's see here. Uh, at oops, uh, Linux dot cs dot pd and uh, c e c s dot pdx edu. Can everybody see that okay? Make it a little bigger. Uh, okay, so now my Java, I think it's Java 11, Java 12. Okay, cool. And so then the Java that you want is there. So I think if you say add package, is that how that works? You want Java 12. As opposed to Isabel 2013, which I don't even know what that does. Okay. It's system proofs. Do uh, yes. Yeah. I don't, yeah. Uh, bad Dave. I don't actually use the add package system. I just configure my bash RC. Um, I'm funny like that. But yeah. So Java 12 is what you want. Good question. Nice going. And I typed really fast, which I have been known to do. Do buttons work? No, oh, neato. Whoa, what was that? Okay. So I just, I just used the add pkg command to, to do that. And what add package is some, like, thing that updates your, your environment, like your path variable and your bash rc or whatever shell you're doing, I guess. A anybody here on cat? Part of the cat? Please? Really? Yeah, yeah? Okay. Uh, okay. They, they know a lot more about the PSU machines than I do, and so then uh, let me know if I say anything wrong. That's probably the most important thing. Are some people able to run this, the um, survey program yet? Yeah. You have to, you have to exit out of the SSH. Uh, so restart your shell? Okay, right. So the add package thing will configure your environment, but then you need to log out and log back in. Have you tried unplugging and plugging back in your SSH connection? Cool. Okay. So um, that's it for the syllabus. Um, what else can I tell you about general things about the course or grading or uh, things like that? Yes. Sure. Thank you for yes. And it's February fifth. There is yes. It's like Labor Day. No class. 
So. Uh, does our repository have to follow the menu that you provided, or can we just do whatever you want? Oh, uh, very good question. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit. So, like, yeah, create a repository and stuff. Um, the short answer is yes, it can, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, just like the examples will show it one way. Uh, and do you have a third question? Yeah. I'll dive into like super details on pair programming uh, next time. Uh, but basically, what will happen during weeks? Where's the first one? Sorry. Uh, we do these things called coding katas, which are like little program exercises. So starting, <coughs> excuse me, uh, starting in a couple of weeks. So in weeks three, <coughs> excuse me, three, four, and six, we'll do pair programming in here. So during class. So in class, uh, you know, people will buddy up and and do some pair programming um, uh, uh, on one of these problems. So we'll be looking to solve one of the problems. Um, and so then, uh, you know, you and a, a partner will, will do that. We'll, again, again, see way more details about both what pair programming is and then what the expectation is uh, later on. So we do that, so that's, and, and attending one of those is required. That's what you reflect on. Feel free to attend all three. As a matter of fact, you need to come, well, I highly recommend that you come to all three classes. We'll be talking about other stuff and just doing pair programming. Um, and then uh, in the second half of the course, in weeks um, seven, uh, eight, and nine, we'll be doing more advanced katas as mob programming. And here again, we'll leverage these projectors, probably all five with so many people, um, to, uh, to do that. Exactly, yes. Um, my experience in the past is that uh, the, the pair and mob programming um, experiences don't appeal to everybody, um, and that's fine, uh, but in the past it's been like, hey, let's do pair programming, and then people sneak out the back quietly and stuff, and that's, and so you can do that two out of the three times, but there's one time where you got to stay and, uh, and, 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 ex and experience it, and then tell me what you thought. So that's how it's going to work. Uh, there was one other question over here. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll see more about that. Again, this is an experiment. It might be that uh, it goes awfully, and we have to uh, have to change uh, change gears, or that you all you know rate me really low, rate my professor dot com or something. Um, and that's just the risk that I take, I guess. Nice. Anything else? Um, yeah. I'm just wondering what the final. Ah, good question. The final exam, uh, no, you will not be writing code. I will not give you punch cards and have to like do it by hand. Um, we'll talk in way more detail, but uh, it's along the lines of the quizzes. It's uh, again, it's like worth twelve percent, so it's basically like you know two or three you know, two quizzes is uh, basically what it's like. So uh, yeah, not a big deal. Okay. Um, so, uh, over the years, building Java uh, projects has gotten a little bit more complex, and one of the things that I want to make sure that we start a good balance here is merely leveraging tools versus understanding tools. So while uh, I want you to understand like how Maven works and you know uh, all, all of that stuff, I don't want that to be the primary thing that you focus on and have to assemble through. Um, so uh, to help get started in this course, I created a, a GitHub repository called Well Portland State Java Getting Started. And so what we'll do for the next little while is a walk through this getting started exercise. Um, please feel free to play along in real time or just uh, watch stuff going by and knowing that you'll have it on the recording um, and this uh, and this documented uh, you know, and docu what's documented here uh, to uh, then learn to uh, you know how to, how to get started here so um, I have a repository that contains uh, some scripts um, that will uh, sort of get your environment started. Um, there's shell scripts. Sorry, I guess there are a couple of command scripts for Windows. I support the 
Um, shell scripts way better than they do the, uh, the command scripts. Uh, if you have a, uh, a suggestion on how to improve them, I'll show you how you can uh, uh, submit that. But the idea here is that uh, this will help you get started in your, uh, you know, with your projects, uh, with your class, with the class. So it makes things, it, it makes working with Apache Maven a little bit more, um, a little bit more approachable. Um, and actually, Maven's one of the things that you, uh, you know, that you will learn in quite a quite a bit of detail in the course. How many of you have used Git and GitHub before? Oh, good, everybody. So, you know, you've at least seen it and sort of understand what it is, right? You know, you have this source code repository and you can have a local copy, you can have a copy remotely and, and, and stuff like that. Um, I'm using GitHub more and more in the course because I found it easy, that's an easy way to communicate with all of you. Um, and so then, uh, while it's not absolutely required, um, I've found that it just makes the students' lives so much easier to have like the backup of the code or to have like, oh wow, look, I, I need to go back to the way the code was two days ago. Oh great, I've got all of that in, in Git and all of that in GitHub. Um, and so to help me get started uh, with, uh, with Git and just developing in general, I have this repository here. Um, so uh, yes, you need to install Git and so I have some, uh, uh, some, some ideas of how to do that. Um, this very first step is a, a little interesting. So uh, you might have maybe a clone, some, you know, clone a repository that's out there. Maybe you forked a repository to make your own copy of somebody else's. Um, one of the things that's really awesome about GitHub is that it makes all this code visible. But when you're working on a class and the professor said, hey, you can't let anybody else see your code, how do you do that? Well, so you make what's called a private repository. And unfortunately, in GitHub, you can't make a fork into a private repository. So instead, you need to do a little bit of a Git magic to make it so that you can have a private repository hosted on GitHub that starts out with the contents of my public repository in this Portland State Getting Started um, repository. Um, Private repositories normally cost money, but if you uh, create a GitHub student account, which uh, you can do, or maybe some of you have, uh, it'll give you, I don't know, a couple of five or something free repository, free private repositories. Um, so uh, the first thing that uh, I'd like you to do is then create a private GitHub repository uh, for the source code in this course. Um, I recommend that you call it uh, Portland State Java Winter 2020. That's what I'll use for mine, although mine will be public so everybody can see it. You can, but you can call it whatever you'd like. Um, it doesn't matter uh, to me. Um, really, the, pro the repository is for your use, um, so you can call it whatever you want. So let's see here. Um, so the first step I'm going to do then is uh, I'm going to create a new repository. And I do that by saying new repository. I'm going to call it, yeah. Oh, really? It's all... Oh, cool. Great. So nothing special required. Okay. Good to know. They're making it easier. Smart. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad the Microsoft money is doing some good in the world, besides curing malaria and stuff. Thank you, Mr. Gates. Okay. So I'm creating a new project, a new repository. I want to call it Portland State Java Winter 2020. Um, you don't need, actually, don't put a description, do not initialize it with a readme, all of that will come from my repository. So, I've uh, created this one. Great, now I've got, it says, oh look, you're, it's all empty, that's fine. I'm going to go back to my getting started repository and keep following the directions. Okay, so there's a little bit of magic here, which is all sort of get um, get stuff uh, that makes it so that you can take my repository that's public and use it as a starting point for your repository, which is which is private. So the first thing I want to do locally, uh, I'm gonna. Oops. Oh, I'm on. There we go. Uh, I'm going to make what's called a bare clone of my getting started repository. And that has, yeah, I now gives, it gives me this directory called Portland State Getting uh, Started 
dot get. And basically what this does is it just gets all, like, all the raw files and everything like that. It's not really a repository. Um, it's also disconnected from the, uh, from the repository on, on GitHub. Um, and now what I want to do is I want to go into that directory. And I want to do this push dash dash mirror off to my, uh, winter, my, my winter 2020 repository. Make sure I spelled everything correctly. It looks like I did. Oh, it's asking me, oh, because it's using HTTPS, which I guess I can do. Uh, okay. <coughs> Uh, ugh. Okay, sorry. I don't remember what my password is off the top of my head, so I'm going to use a different protocol instead of uh, instead of HTTPS. Oops. Uh, repositories. There you go. Winter in 2020. I'll just use this instead. Yep. Okay, so what that did is it took this uh, bare clone of my, uh, my just getting started repository, took, which basically has all the revisions there, and pushed it up to my winter 2020. So now when I go and look at this, it's got all my stuff from the other repository. So these are two different repositories with all the same stuff in them. For people following along at home, is that working? I see a couple of nods. Okay, okay. good, good, good. Okay. So anyway, so now what I've got is uh, my winter 2020 uh, repository that has all this stuff. It has all of the um, all of the scripts in it, it has this parent palm, all sorts of good stuff like that. And so the idea now is that if I were a student, uh, I could now use this repository for, uh, for all of my code. So, oops, let me go back down to the instructions. So now that I've created that on, oops, now that I've created it on GitHub, oh yeah, I don't have a, oh there you go, yeah. Um, I pushed it all there, make sure that I've got all the changes, and I have. Now I want to get rid of the, the bear clone. Portland, oops. I'm going to show RF. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this window a little shorter <coughs> so that you can see it. Arm dash RF. Uh, oh, look at this. I can have this in the background. There you go. Portland State Java getting started. Git. And now I will just make a clone of my other repository. So don't worry if this feels like magic. It kind of is. Uh, oh, I'm not going to use the HTTPS because I don't remember what my password is. Uh, I've got H I've got SSH keys for that. Um, clone. Copy this. Java winter 2020. Great. And now I've got all of my stuff. So this first step, at the end of this first step, what now you have is a, your own GitHub repository that is initialized with the contents of my getting started repository that now you can start working in and start doing your own stuff and not have to worry about it either being visible to everybody else because it's a private repository or having it mess with my, with my repository. Um, uh, yeah, mess with my repository. Okay. Um, let's see here. So you've got this repository. Well, that's great. What's in it? Well, some scripts that build Java files and stuff. So you need to make sure that your um, environment is configured correctly. So you need to go off and get some tools. Uh, the, uh, the first one is actually probably the only tool that you need to get is the Java development kit. So the Java development kit includes the compiler, the runtime, and a whole bunch of other tools that you'll see over the course of the um, uh, of, the, of this course um, that uh, that let you work with with Java. Um, so uh, we'll need to install that. 
And uh, you'll need to be running, well, the latest or at least, I think it's version 11 is what I'm using here locally. Uh, they're releasing Java way more often than they used to. Um, and so then I think 11 or greater will be fine for this course. There's a tool called Maven that you'll see a lot in this course. And Maven is for building uh, Java projects. So, you know, your Java project consists of, yes, source code, but it might also have things like configuration files, it might have icons, it might have sounds that your application plays, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and managing all these files and uh, you know, invoking the compiler in just the right way and invoking the runtime just the right way to run your unit tests um, as part of your build um, is, uh, can be a little tricky and a little tedious. And so what Maven does is it puts together a bunch of standards for directory layout, for file name conventions, things like that. Um, and then it uh, allows you to say things like, yes, build all my code, or run all of my tests after building all of my code, or build whatever you know, application that I'm building and, and then deploy it where it needs to be run. Um, please watch the Maven lecture to learn all about that, but it's a fundamental tool that we use in this course. Um, there is a configuration file for your Maven installation that uh, you'll need, and um, I've provided it to you in a uh, file called settings.html, which does things like says, oh, hey, artifacts that Dave published, go find them over here on this thing called bin tray. Um, I guess really that's all it's doing. So you need to copy that to the .m2 directory in your, uh, under your home directory. And on Windows, uh, I have to remember exactly where it is. Um, I think if you say, um, say Maven dash version, does it tell you? Yeah, it tells you Maven Home. So then uh, if you run this on Windows, you'll see some Windows file path probably off your home directory. No, wait, sorry, no, it's not Maven Home. Where is, that's not what you're looking for. It's, it's your home directory, which unfortunately doesn't tell you where it is. Okay, viral variable, and if uh, worst comes to worst, just go look for the, um, if you look for, you know, Maven Windows home directory, it'll tell you where it is. Uh, or maybe Maven, Maven settings.html, or docs.xml on Windows. Anyway, it's so nice that we have the internet to ask these questions for because I can't remember all this stuff. Okay. Now, okay, so you've gotten this repository, you've gotten GitHub, and now you've installed Java and you've uh, configured your settings.xml for, for Maven. It's time to start doing stuff. So uh, I have uh, a little digression here. Um, to get us started and to start looking at uh, how we do programming, I have this little project called Project Zero. Um, and uh, all my projects kind of look like this. This is an optional project. It's not really a project act for anyway. It's just getting uh, getting you started with something. And the whole idea here is that in this little uh, project, um, you write a class called student that extends human. Human is one of my classes that I wrote. You'll see it in the lecture notes. Um, it uh, it has some methods and stuff that you can overwrite. Um, and this is a, a simple little project where the whole idea is that it's your first Java code and you write this one, uh, you write this one class. And we'll dive more into this in a little bit. But the way you get started with this is that you uh, create a, um, a, a, a you create a Maven project from what's called an archetype uh, that'll be customized to to you and your name. So we run the create project zero script. Create project zero dot sh, and you give it your username. My username is Whitlock. Yours can be whatever you want. Um, might as well use your Unix name. And this does a bunch of things. It goes off and downloads. Uh, said it was successful. Good. Um, it uh, goes off and creates a new project uh, in, a, in a student directory. So it creates a directory called student that then contains uh, all sorts of 
uh, Maven-y goodness, um, including some source code to get started. So uh, it goes and creates that. Next thing you want to do is cd into that directory, and then you want to build your Maven project. Uh, and so then there's a script called Maven W or Maven wrapper that you want to run. First, you need to make it executable. Maven W. And now you can run Maven W. Uh, what do I say? Maven W verify. So what this does is it takes all of the code that was created when you ran that script, compiles it, it runs the unit tests, um, it runs what are called integration tests against it also, and oh good, everything passed. So this verifies that you've got your Maven environment configured correctly, that you have your Java environment uh, uh, configured, installed and configured correctly, so that you can start doing stuff with, with Java in this course. Um, oh, no, you won't see it because I've downloaded all the libraries, but probably those of you who are running this for the first time are seeing, uh, may even download, you know, hundreds of, uh, of libraries out there from the internet. This is one of the things that Maven offers you, right? You'll, there's a lot of third-party code that we leverage in this course, um, such as the, the JUnit framework for writing unit tests, uh, or the Hamcrest library for having nice assertions, uh, in your unit tests, um, Things like that, and Maven manages all of this for you. Once you, you know, when you look at the, uh, when, when you watch the lectures, you'll see how all of that works, and hopefully get a better appreciation for what it really buys you. So uh, what we've done here is uh, we've added some stuff to. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, so the script has created some files for us, and those are uh, we, we added those to the directory. We haven't added them to Git though, and we haven't pushed it up to the the repository yet. So let's do that as the first thing that we need to do. So uh, actually, if we say Git status here, we'll see that there are two uh, two things that need to be that have been modified. One is the parent pom.xml. Um, and I won't go into too many specifics tonight, but every time that you create a project, it updates this parent project um, in, uh, in, the, in the repository. Um, and as we'll see next week, this is really nice having one parent project because then you can build all of your code all in one fell swoop. Um, and so it's added the student module to the parent project. And so now we want to commit, uh, let's see here, my, oh, first of all, we got to say git add student. And so now here are all of the um, files that have been added inside the, uh, the student directory. Um, there's something called the Maven wrapper, which we'll talk about later. Um, but most importantly, here's all the source code. There's three simple uh, classes for, the, uh, for that project. There's a student class, there's the, a there's the unit test and the integration tests. Um, after we take a brief break, we'll dive into all of this stuff. We'll also add the parent palm.xml into all of that. And so now we can see all of the files that we modified. And so now let's commit them. Let's check them in. Say git commit um, added the student project. Great. So that's committed to the local repository. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, pipe. Oh. Okay. Right. Yeah. So what pipe does is it takes. Um, Standard error, standard output, um, and sends it to another command, another process. Yep. So I just piped it into less. Yeah. If you don't pipe it into less, it doesn't look so good on the screen. Oops. I, don't, I have no more diffs. Um, but yeah, I pipe it into less so that you can scroll it, and uh, there are some like terminal characters. That I think get diff will spit out, and so it makes it look better that way. Those are the kind of questions I like. Because like you did something, I didn't understand it. You're talking really fast. Um, yeah. Okay. So now I've um, I've committed to my local repository. Now what I want to do is I want to push the commits uh, up to the uh, up to the remote repository. I did that, and now when I go and I look, 
uh, I can see, and I, and I reload. Yep, added the student project. That is the, my latest commit. And so I can go look at that, and here is all the stuff that I added. And so, uh, you know, for those of you who don't have a lot of experience with Git and GitHub, this is what you can do. You can make changes on your local machine. You can commit them to the local repository, uh, which means that you, uh, well, it's sort of like there as a backup or it's there as history. Um, and then when you want to, uh, then you can do a push up to GitHub, which takes all those changes, puts them in the repository on GitHub. And the nice thing about this then is that, hey, maybe I want to work on a different machine. Like I want to work on the PSU machines now. You can just use GitHub, you can get a clone from GitHub, you can get all the changes from GitHub. Um, and so you know, gone on to the days of having to like copy files around or, or whatever. You can use GitHub and it manages all of it for you. You have nice robust version control and you can also roll back in time to know good versions. GitHub's really nice. Okay. And actually, let's take a look at that right now, right before break. Um, so, I, uh, I've, over here on my local machine, I have, uh, I've uh, put everything in GitHub. So what I'll do over here, oops, that's not what I wanted. I'll uh, get another window going with my, uh, and I'll SSH into the oops, uh, into the PSU machine. And what I'll do is I will then make a clone of my repository, of my winner repository here. So now I have a Portland State Java winner 2020. It's got my student uh, code right here. And now after I do the chmod to make the Maven wrapper uh, executable, I can do Maven wrapper uh, clean verify. And now it'll go through and do the same build. So this is a, you know important thing to realize. This is why we use Maven. This is why we use GitHub. I want to make sure that the code that I'm working with is exactly the same whether I'm working on my local machine or whether I'm working on the, the PSU machine. Because here again, I've had lots of students over the years who've gotten mixed up where they're like, oh, I copied this file to the PSU machine, but not that one. Or, oh, I made some change over here and then I accidentally overwrote it and lost two hours worth of work. Ugh, awful. There are tools for this, and these are the same tools that professional software developers use. So not only are they like tested by millions of people, um, they uh, you know they're, they're, they're demonstrated to do the job they need to do. Uh, they'll work for you. And so by leveraging Maven, by leveraging GitHub, you can uh, very easily validate that all your code is the same everywhere, and that it uh, and it runs the same. So th that these are the kind of patterns that I hope you'll be able to leverage in the course. Now you can get you can get through the course by using SFTP and by doing all this hard work yourself. Um, and great if you want to add extra challenge, but that's not what that's not the intent of the course, right? The intent of the course is to help you uh, learn about contemporary programming techniques using Java. Um, it's not like you know making sure that you know how to copy files around uh, around safely. You can take advanced programming with file copying for that. Uh, yeah. um, I'm not going to go into this stuff here, uh, but basically, uh, hey, let's say that uh, it's possible that over the course of the term, there's going to be something that I change in my getting started repository that, uh, that you all want. Let's say there's a bug in the script or something, or I don't know, I, I add something that I want all of you to get. Um, you, can, uh, you can do the following. You can say... So, so in, in Git, uh, there's the notion of there's local repository and then there's uh, remote repositories. And so then when we did the Git clone, I'm pretty sure, what we say, Git remote uh, dash v? Yeah. Okay. So um, the repository, so it's like, hey, I've got like this 
source code repository that has version control. I've got that Git repository there on my local machine. And there's this notion of the remote uh, of remote repositories, which are the same repository but in other places, and they might be at different points in their lifetime. They might have different versions out there. And so one uh, one remote repository is called Origin, um, and this is where uh, this is the one that's on GitHub as opposed to the one that's locally, um, and it's it's my winter uh, 2020. Uh, repository, and so when I do a git push or when I do a git pull, it'll push uh, or I say fetch, I say, but fetch, uh, fetch and push um, from this repository. I can associate other re remote repositories with it. Um, in particular, uh, there's one called I, I want to have what's called an upstream repository, which is the original getting started one. So I say git remote add upstream, and the name of the repository is upstream, and there's the URL. And so now when I look at the repositories, I've got uh, origin and I've got upstream. Oh, I didn't want the HTTPS one, though. Sorry. Well, anyway. Um, no, I want to take that out now. Uh, remove upstream. RM upstream. I don't remember the name of it. Great. Oh, by the way, um, I use the HTTPS URLs in the in the README there because that's because experience showed that's easier for you all. So you have to manage your SSH keys and everything like that. Um, it's actually reversed for me. It's like I got it working with the SSH keys. I don't want to mess with it, and I can't remember my GitHub password. Um, it's there someplace, but I don't know. I don't have a pet though, so I don't know what you can't guess it. Um, so anyway, so I want to set the uh, remote. Repository to be not the HTTPS one, but to be the get a GitHub one. Oops. Great. So now we've got that. And now what I can do, and here again, this is just for an example. I don't know how often you'll be doing it. Um, If, let's say I make a change to the um, getting started repository and it's a change that you want, then you can execute this command, git pull upstream master, which will say, hey, pull all the changes from the upstream repository that aren't already in my local repository on the master branch into, uh, into my local repository. We might have to see this later in the course. I'm just saying you can do it now if you want. Uh, and then you pull all those changes into your local repository. If there are any conflicts, you can resolve them. And then you just do a git push, which will push it back to the origin repository, which is kind of the default repository, default remote repository. Um, and that'll get all of them onto your like winter 2020 uh, repository. Lots of fun with GitHub. Probably weren't expecting that, were you? Okay. Any questions on that? Let's take a break. I've been talking for an hour. I'm a little parched. I need something to drink. Let's take 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll start looking at some Java code.